Welcome back to our class on the Canons of Dort for today. You've done it. You've made it. We're at the conclusion of our study, and in fact, today we will look at the conclusion of the Canons of Dort. Let me pray for us, and we'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the blessing of this study, and we thank you that you have enabled us to persevere in this study, that you have blessed us with insight that we might see the, the studies of those who have gone before us, and that we might glorify you, that we might be faithful to you. And so we pray today that as we conclude our study, that this would not be the conclusion of our thoughts upon this topic, but rather we would be reminded consistently of the truths of your word and the truths of our doctrine. We pray that you would bless our time today we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you would assume from your study of the Canons of Dort, uh, the Synod of Dort uh, does not conclude simply by saying the end. Uh, they're going to make a statement on what they have done, and actually they are going to address some lies, as they refer to them, that have been told about the Reformed faith. And so in concluding, they are supporting the Reformed faith, that Reformed faith that had come out of uh, primarily Geneva and Calvin's teaching uh, that had flourished within Western Europe and, of course, would uh, dramatically impact Western civilization as we know it. Uh, essentially, what they're doing in this conclusion is they are stating what they confess, what we confess in the Reformed faith, and that what we confess is derived from Scripture. What I want to do is I want to read, as I have done before, uh, I want to read the conclusion, but we're going to work our way through it in bits and pieces because quite candidly, the conclusion is, is long and uh, me reading it to you, uh, well, I think it would get a little boring and so I want to start out and read it and then we'll pause as we work our way through it to address some of the points that I want to draw to your attention. The conclusion of the Canons of Dort. And this is the perspicuous, simple, and ingenious declaration of the orthodox doctrine respecting the five articles which have been converted in the Belgic churches, and the rejection of the errors with which they have for some time been troubled. This doctrine the synod judges to be drawn from the word of God and to be agreeable to the confession of the Reformed churches. Whence it clearly appears that some whom such conduct by no means became have violated all truth, equity, and charity in wishing to persuade the public. Now, what they're doing there is, of course, they're, they're addressing uh, the rise of the, the remonstrants and uh, Jacob Arminius' disciples who have uh, essentially attacked uh, these specific areas in the Reformed faith. Uh, you'll note here that they're referring to uh, what they have stated in the Canons of Dort as orthodox doctrine, that is, orthodox Christian belief. And now, what they're going to do, and what I'm uh, about to read to you, is uh, they are going to state uh, essentially six lies that were told about the Reformed faith uh, by the Arminians, by the remonstrants. Uh, again, um, I'm, I'm using the term six lies. I'm, I'm borrowing from Robert Godfrey and his translation of the conclusion. Uh, it's not essentially what they're going to, uh, they're not going to use that term here, uh, but you'll see as I read through it, and I'll, I'll try to, with, with my voice, draw out to you uh, these different uh, six lies that were told about the Reformed faith. So what they're doing here is they're quoting from 
the Arminians, the Arminian, the Remonstrants attack against the Reformed faith. So, quote, the, the doctrine of the Reformed churches concerning predestination and the points annexed to it by its own genius and necessary tendency leads off the minds of men from all piety and religion. That it is an opiate <laughs> drug, an opiate administered by the flesh and the devil, and the stronghold of Satan where he lies in wait for all, and from which he wounds multitudes and mortally strikes through many with the darts both of despair and security. That it makes God the author of sin, unjust, tyrannical, hypocritical, that it is nothing more than an interpolated Stoicism, Manichaeism, Libertinism, Turkism, that it renders men carnally secure, since they are persuaded by it that nothing can hinder the salvation of the elect. Let them live as they please, and therefore that they may safely perpetrate every species of the most atrocious crimes." And that if the reprobate should even perform truly all the works of the saints, their obedience would not in the least contribute to their salvation. That the same doctrine teaches that God, by a mere arbitrary act of His will, without the least respect or view to any sin, has predestinated the greatest part of the world to eternal damnation, and has cre created them for this very purpose." And that in the same manner in which the election is the fountain and cause of faith and good works, reprobation is the cause of unbelief and impiety. That many children of the faithful are torn, guiltless, from their mother's breast and tyrannically plunged into hell, so that neither baptism nor the prayers of the church at their baptism can at all profit them. And many other things of the same kind which the Reformed churches not only do not acknowledge, but even detest with their whole soul. All right, so now you, you can hear there, and I, I, I probably didn't do as good a job as I had intended of, of pausing. You can hear uh, each of these allegations that are made by the Arminians against the Reformed faith. And, and as I read it, hopefully, uh, through this study and, and your learning through the articles as well as the rejection of errors, you, you heard things that were uh, to, to, to prick your memory, so to speak, uh, to say, ah, now that was addressed previously. And you may not recall which article or which head of doctrine it was addressed in, but at least you're, you're hearing some of this false doctrine as it's stated, and, and you're hearing, aha, I, I know now that this has been covered. And so one of the things I want to encourage you before I walk us through these six lies, one of the things that I want to encourage you in uh, is to uh, get a copy of the uh, Canons of Dort. Uh, you can find it online. It's very accessible. Uh, if you have a uh, Reformation Study Bible that's produ uh, produced by, uh, I think it's pub yeah, published by Ligonier Ministries, uh, there's actually a copy, not the version I'm using, but another copy of the Canons of Dort in the back uh, of that study Bible. So there are a number of places where you can access the Canons of Dort, and I, I really encourage you to, to go back work your way through this historic doctrine to refresh your memory uh, on what we have studied up to this point and through this study. Now, the six lies that are told uh, are actually, even though it may not have sounded like it while I was reading it, are, are actually fairly simply stated, and, and candidly, I, I may oversimplify them just for our sake uh, in this short lecture today. But uh, they're fairly easily stated. The first lie that the Arminians tell against the Reformed tradition is that predestination leads to sinful living. Well, how many times has this been addressed in our previous study and the different heads of doctrine within the Canons of Dort? Uh, they, they really like that argument. And they believe it's a strong argument that if you believe that you are of the elect, that you will have the attitude that, well, I can just live however I want to. I can sin as I please because, well, I'm of the elect. Uh, and, and that is uh, a false 
teaching. Uh, that is just simply not true. We know from our previous study that, in fact, those who are of the elect, whom God grants faith, they actually, by God's grace, through faith in Christ, desire to please God. doesn't mean that they're perfect. doesn't mean that they're sinless. But it does mean that they desire to please God, that they do not, or maybe I should say we do not, uh, uh, think that we can just go out and live as we want to, to, to live like the devil, so to speak, to use that expression. So, the first lie is, is that uh, the doctrine of predestination lives, leads to sinful living. The second lie is that God is a tyrant, the, the Reformed faith teaches that God is a tyrant and predestin a predestination a form of determinism. Uh, they're, they're saying, now, in the Reformed tradition, you're making God out to be this tyrant in heaven, and that you're teaching in that, that he has ordained whatsoever comes to pass from eternity past, that you're teaching in that a form of determinism. Uh, again, the idea of determinism is that uh, we are merely robots, that because God is sovereign, that, that he simply has wound us up, and, and he is the puppet in heaven and everything that we do is just simply a robot, robotic mechanism of what he uh, directs. And, and we know that's not to be the case. Uh, we know that God in fact works through means and he actually works through us. Uh, a perfect example of this in Christian teaching is prayer. Um, God does in fact ordain whatsoever comes to pass, but he works through through the means of the prayers of his people. And so uh, we do not believe in determinism, uh, but we do believe that Scripture teaches both, that God is in fact sovereign and has ordained all things, including salvation, including reprobation. So also we believe that God works through means, and he works through our wills, and that we are not merely robotic or robots. There are three things, there are four things actually that they list in this, in their, their argument. One is they, they point back to uh, Stoicism, the, the philosophy of, of, of the Stoics, that somehow the Reformed faith is, is drawing from that philosophical tradition rather than Scripture. Uh, that is simply not the case. In fact, uh, there are a number of areas uh, that... Uh, uh, scripture strongly disagrees with Stoic philosophy, uh, specifically in regards to uh, God's work in our emotions and our pleasures and so forth. Um, they also list uh, Manichaeism, or Manichaeism, how, how Manichae, hmm, it seems like there ought to be another syllable in there. Anyway, uh, that's a teaching from the second century. It's not my notes, so uh, I may be a little off by a century, uh, but uh, it's a teaching derived from the second century, uh, influenced by Gnosticism. Essentially, you know it as uh, Star Wars. Uh, it's the idea of, of dualism. There's good and there's evil. And, um, and so the uh, Armenians are saying, well, you, the Reformed tradition really just sort of teaches sort of this this idea of of, uh, of of dualism, and that's simply not the case. We understand through Scripture uh, that it's not true. They add to that the uh, the uh, accusation of libertinism, uh, the idea, and, and coupled with antinomianism, that somehow uh, we're just simply to free to, to live freely, unshackled from laws or constraints. And then finally, they add to that, interestingly enough, uh, the expression Turkism. Uh, and if you're not familiar with uh, that term, uh, it simply is reference to Islam. Uh, the idea that somehow the Reformed faith is more akin to uh, the Islamic understanding of God. Uh, the idea, if you've ever heard the expression, uh, it is the will of Allah, uh, the, the idea of essentially determinism in the Muslim faith, and of course that is a false accusation as well. And so uh, the point simply is this, is that uh, they were casting these lies uh, because they wanted to protect 
Remember, I emphasized this in previous lectures, they really wanted to protect the sovereignty of human free will. Uh, and I'm using the word sovereignty to direct it to their position, not our position. Uh, but the idea that the human will, uh, in fact, is sovereign and uh, that God uh, is, so to speak, responding to the free will of man in the area of, of salvation. And, uh, of course, we do not believe that in the Reformed tradition, uh, but we also refute the lie that predestination uh, is a form of determinism and that God is a tyrant. Uh, that is false. The third lie that they tell is that the elect can live lives of debauchery and yet still be secure and that the non-elect can desire salvation and yet not be saved. Now let's break that into two parts. Uh, on, on the one hand, uh, do we believe that we are justified by faith in Christ, uh, not by works? Yes, we believe that. Ephesians chapter 2, very clear. Do we also believe that there are times where our lives may get entangled in sin and yet still be recipients of God's grace. Yes, we believe that as well. What we don't believe is that the true, the truly elect can go and live lives of debauchery, my word, not theirs, and with no constraints for their entirety, that there be no signs uh, of their conversion, there be no fruit evidencing uh, their true faith in Christ. And, and, and that is that we believe that uh, their accusation is a, a false one. And again, you see the tie-in there with the first lie. But the second part that they add to that is that they believe that we teach, that the Reformed faith teaches that if you are not of the elect, you may pine after salvation in Christ. Uh, you may truly desire to have eternal life. You may truly want to be a child of God through faith in Christ, but because you're not of the elect, well, you're out of luck. It's just not going to work out for you. Uh, well, that's a false accusation. Uh, the, the, we believe that, in fact, all of the elect do, in fact, come to saving faith in Christ because it is the work of the Holy Spirit, that regenerating work of the Holy Spirit through which faith. And therefore, those who long salvation in Jesus Christ are evidencing that they are of the elect, not of the reprobate. And so uh, we, they, uh, we deny uh, this lie. The fourth lie that's told is that the reprobate are predestined without regard to their sin. And what they're drawing on there is that those who are of the elect were elected or predestined before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter 1, and that those who were uh, of the non-elect, the reprobate, were not. Now you may remember that consistently in Reformed teaching, you'll hear the expression that God passed over them. God passed over the reprobate. God passed over the, the non-elect. Uh, and, and there's a reason for that expression uh, because it is avoiding the Arminian allegation that God, in fact, predestined them and, as we'll get to in just a second, and their sin. Uh, but rather what we see is that God passes over them in eternity past, and it is evidenced in the sin of their lives. In fact, uh, sinners do precisely what they love to do in whatever form they desire to do, that is, they sin. And so there is evidence of that, not absence of it. The fifth lie is that God gives faith and good works to the elect and gives unbelief and wickedness to the elect. In other words, what they're saying there is because we in the Reformed tradition, drawing from Ephesians chapter 2, say that faith is a gift. It is given from God. And in fact, in keeping with Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, that not only is faith a gift from God, so also our good works 
are given from God as well. Now that is true. We do believe that. But what we don't believe, and the allegation that the Arminians are making, is that God also gives the gift of unbelief and wickedness. I mean, I am astounded with that allegation. It is so contrary to Scripture. But what they're doing, they meaning the Arminians, what they're doing in that argument is they're saying, well, if you're going to have one, then we think you should have the other. In other words, if God is going to give the gift of faith, so also God should be the one who gives the unbelief or the lack of faith as if it too is a gift. And if God is the one who gives obedience to the elect by His grace through faith in Christ, well then we also think that God is the one who gives the wickedness. Again, uh, arguing that that's what we teach or that's what we uh, believe. Uh, and, and again, that truly is contrary to Scripture and it is an affront to God to even make that allegation uh, and so, it, of course, it was rejected. And incidentally, uh, you see that that is rejected consistently through uh, the different heads of doctrine. And then sixthly, uh, they say that many infants go to hell since they are not of the elect. And you may recall specifically that the, the synod uh, stated in the Canons of Dort that all infants uh, dying are of the elect. And so uh, what, what the Arminians uh, were doing is they're saying, well, first of all, you guys say that there are less of the elect than of the non-elect. And because there are babies who die in infancy, that therefore uh, they are more than likely of the non-elect. And so you're teaching in the Reformed Church that uh, the majority of these children who die in their infancy are going to hell. And you, you, may, you heard it there in the, the graphic language, being torn from their mother's breast, so to speak, uh, or not so to speak, literally they say that uh, in their argument, they meaning the army. Well, all of these, six of these, are lies told by the Arminians historically against the Reformed tradition. Uh, some of these you may hear in modern forms, uh, some of these you may not hear at all. Uh, but the point is, is to ask, is uh, where do we go to know the truth? Now, where do we go to, to push back against lies that are told about Orthodox Christianity? Well, we do as the Synod did. The Synod went to Scripture. Yes, they drew from history. Uh, we hear the references to Pelagius consistently. Uh, they were students of church history, uh, but consistently they go to Scripture, to draw from Scripture that what we believe may be supported on Scripture. And so after stating these lies, then the Synod of Dort moves forward, and I want you to listen to this, as they move forward with words of, of caution. Wherefore, this Synod of Dort, in the name of the Lord, conjures as many as piously call upon the name of our Savior Jesus Christ to judge of the faith of the Reformed churches, not from the calumnies, but rather which on every side are heaped upon it, nor from the private expressions of a few among ancient and modern teachers, often dishonestly quoted or corrupted and wrested to a meaning quite foreign to their intention, but from the public professions of the churches themselves and from this declaration of the orthodox doctrine confirmed by the unanimous consent of all and each member of the whole synod. You may recall in the introduction I told you that uh, the canons were produced by a unanimous vote in the synod. 
Moreover, the synod warns columnators themselves to consider the terrible judgment of God which awaits them for bearing false witness against the confessions of so many churches, for distressing the consciences of the weak, and for laboring to render suspected the society of the truly faithful. And so what they're doing in this part, after having stated the six lies that were told against the Reformed faith, the Reformed churches, they then issue a warning. And, and their warning is to both those who are in the churches, but so also those who are lying, those who are of uh, the persuasion of the Arminian arguments. And essentially what they're doing here uh, is they're, they're label, labeling them false teachers, false teachers who are infiltrated the church and teaching uh, these untruths. Then they go on. Finally, this synod exhorts all their brethren in the gospel of Christ to conduct themselves piously and religiously in handling this doctrine, both in the universities and churches, to direct it as well in discourse as in writing to the glory of the divine name, to holiness of life, and to the consolation of afflicted souls, to regulate by Scripture, according to the analogy of faith, not only their sentiments, but also their language, and to abstain from all those phrases which, which exceed the limits necessary to be observed in ascertaining the genuine sense of the Holy Scriptures." And many furnish insolent sophists with a just pretext for violently assailing or even vilifying the doctrine of the Reformed churches. Now, there's one last paragraph I want to read to you, uh, but before I, I go to that, Note here that after stating the six lies, after issuing a warning to those in the Reformed churches and also those who are spreading what they refer to as false teaching within the church, they then give instruction to the ministers and teachers, both to the universities as well as to the churches. And that instruction is to be faithful to God's Word. That instruction is to know these doctrines and so also to point the uh, people within the church as well as believers in the church as well as students in the universities. Of course, the universities in that age were tied to the national church. But nevertheless, that they should point them to the truth of these doctrines. And so uh, they're saying that if you want to deal with the truth, and if you want to uh, counteract false teaching in the church, it starts in the pulpit. And it starts in the universities, or in, in our modern lingo, we might say seminaries. Um, and candidly, I, I think that's great advice for us uh, today. Um, I think that we should be preaching these doctrines from the pulpit. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, in typical Spurgeon hyperbole, uh, argued that uh, every sermon that he preached contains uh, the essence of these five heads of doctrine or five points of Calvinism as he referred to them. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know. What I do know is if you read Spurgeon's sermons, they drip with the truths of uh, these five heads of doctrines, the truths of the canons of Dort, of course, because Spurgeon preached the word. And so we should, pastors like myself and others, we should be faithful to preach the word. And we should not force these doctrines into our when we come to them within the passages that we are expositing, that we should, in fact, be faithful to the truth of these historic doctrines because they are derived from the Word of God. So also in our seminaries, and so also I would say to you, dear student, that you too should be faithful to know and to study the historic doctrines of our church. Well, they conclude this in a sense with a prayer. And let me read it to you, but I want you to hear it with the language of prayer. May Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who, seated at the Father's right hand, gives gifts to men, sanctify us in the truth. Bring to the truth those who err. 
shut the mouths of the columnators of sound doctrine and endue the faithful ministers of His Word with the spirit of wisdom and discretion, that, that all their discourses may tend to the glory of God and the edification of those who hear them. Amen. In their ending prayer, what they're praying essentially is, is that God would preserve the faithful in truth. Uh, that we would be faithful students of the Word, that we would be faithful to know our historic doctrines, uh, that we would be faithful in the truth, that God would sustain us. The second thing that they pray in this prayer is that God would lead those in error to the truth. That those who were teaching the false teaching within the Reformed Church, that, that God would graciously lead them to the truth. The third thing that they pray for in this prayer is that, they, that God would shut the mouths of the false teachers. Uh, my, my words, not theirs, but that's essentially what they're praying for. That God would close the mouths of those who were teaching false doctrine. Oh, that God would do that in this very day. And then fourthly, they pray that God would bless ministers to teach the truth. That God would bless ministers to teach the truth of God's Word. Uh, that they would not be, uh, as I called it in a previous lecture, closet Calvinists. <laughs> but uh, that they would, uh, as they come across these points of doctrine in God's Word, they would be faithful to preach the Word and to teach the historic faith that we believe well, that concludes our study. I am so grateful for this opportunity. I am humbled, quite frankly, with the opportunity to teach on this and to teach you this. I hope that it has been a blessing to you. I promise you it has been a blessing to me. So thank you, and now let us thank our almighty and sovereign God. Our gracious heavenly God, our heavenly Father, we acknowledge you are indeed sovereign. And we pray, as the Synod prayed, that you would preserve us in the truth. That we would be faithful to the truth of your word. We pray for those who teach error, those who teach false doctrine, asking that you would graciously lead them to the truth of your word. We ask that you would shut the mouths of false teachers in our day, where false teaching is rampant, we pray that you would sovereignly shut their mouths. And then we pray, as the Synod concluded, that you would bless the ministers of your church to be faithful to teach the truth. May we preach the truth. May your church know the truth. May you be glorified above all. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, indeed our Savior. Amen.